1999. This is part of my PhD that I'm conducting under uh, Teresa Perez Prado at Indian Materials in Madrid and in collaboration with ITP Aero, uh, one of the world leading aircraft engine component manufacturers. I will begin. What? Can I? Yeah, I will begin with a brief introduction of Incon 99 and uh, the work that has been done so far regarding LPBF of this alloy. The motivation for our study, the experimental procedures we have followed, and some of the results we have obtained this far. Yeah? So, Incon 99 is a precipitation hardened nickel based super alloy. It has a high chromium and cobalt content, as well as a relatively high titanium and aluminum content, that, which are the gamma prime formers, and responsible for its good properties in terms of mechanical performance and oxidation resistance up to 850 degrees C. Its main application is, is found in gas turbine veins for the energy or air, aircraft uh, field. Yeah. yeah, so it's conventionally processed through casting, but there are already some studies regarding its processing through LPVF, which is a bit complex due to its, to its susceptibility to cracking. Uh, this morning we have seen uh, studies on Inconel 718, 625, x These are relatively easy to process due to its lower content in aluminum and titanium. But in Inconel 99, we have uh, solidification or equation cracking issues. So far, there are only a handful of studies published regarding this topic. If any of you have published something that I have not listed here, I'm sorry, and please do tell me. But uh, so we have studies from people from Chalmers or like uh, Polytechnic Torino Choir around here. And all of these have focused mostly on uh, continuous wave laser processing. And in our case, we're using a pulse wave laser, a initial AM400. And in the first step of, our, of my PhD, we did a parametric study. So we, we studied the influence of power laser, uh, laser power uh, scanning speed and hatch distance on the outcome of the parts. Here I have plotted all the different conditions we studied. In green, we have the relative density. And in orange, I have the correct density here. And out of all these conditions, we selected the two best ones in terms of both relative density and minimal crack density. These two conditions have the same laser power and the same scanning speed. And the only difference is the hatch distance. One is processed with hatch distance 70 micron and a volumetric energy density of 43 joule per millimeter cube. And the other one hatch distance of 50. This is the only difference in terms of scanning conditions between these two samples. From now on, I will call these samples or these conditions 70 and 50 most probably, or 50 micron, 70 micron. So just so you know why. So we went on to characterize the as-built microstructure uh, with uh, this is our EBSD maps that I will be showing uh, through the presentation. Here on the left, we have GND density maps. So just so it's clear from now on, blue means low uh, GND density. Uh, as we move to green, yellow, uh, red, we have higher uh, geometric necessary, necessary location density. Then the EPF uh, coloring maps, they are all plotted in. Uh, so the reference is the direction parallel to the building direction from left to right here. And here is where we can see the differences between 50 and 70. In 50, we have a clear uh, columnar uh, microstructure, which is typical from NPG samples. And we have a strong 001 texture parallel to the uh, building direction. Whereas with the 70 sample, the 70 micron sample, we have a much weaker texture, right? And if we look at the grain size, these are the line intercept values, both for the transversal and longitudinal uh, directions. We see that the grain size in the transversal direction doesn't change much, but the aspect ratio does. So here, another indication of these uh, columnar grains in the 50 micron uh, sample. I don't think I need to convince you about the, the importance of, of or the differences in microstructures depending on the scanning parameters after the, the, the two presentations prior, but another indication. When it comes to the uh, cell solidification, uh, like the, the solidification cell structures, we see that they are quite similar in both cases. We see the value does not change much. And if we do TM analysis, TM characterization, we see that there is clear segregation of titanium. I don't know if you see it from the back, but there's clear segregation of titanium and aerobium in the cell boundaries and in the green boundaries, as well as some uh, particles like this one, this one, which are titanium and aerobium rich carbides. We could not determine the exact composition, but we know we have carbides inside. 
We do not find uh, gamma prime or eta phase precipitating in our ASBIL samples. This is a rather controversial topic in the government are papers that say there is gamma prime in the ASBIL condition, others that say uh, there's uh, eta phase in the ASBIL condition. We did not find any of those, but still, like uh, we do, uh, we do want to study the first step of the typical thermal treatment of uh, incoronal final, which would be a solution heat treatment. So our motivation is to understand the effect of the temperature, time, and starting microstructure on the outcome of the solution heat treatment on the microstructural features and mechanical properties. That's why we are using two different starting microstructures. We want to understand from here the crystallization, dynamics, and kinetics of LPBF in and and the end goal would be to develop a suitable uh, thermal treatment to optimize the mechanical properties for its end use. We performed uh, nine different uh, thermal treatments with uh, two different static microstructures, so three temperatures, three dwell times. And I have to mention here, because later we will see some weird things, or we might see some weird things, that all treatments were performed in a vacuum furnace, which has certain limitations regarding the uh, heating and cooling rates. The heating rate of all our treatments was limited to 4 degrees Celsius per minute, and the cooling rate until 600 degrees C is limited to 2.3 degrees Celsius per minute. So when we look at the microstructural evolution uh, for both conditions, if we first focus on the 50 micron sample, so the strong starting uh, texture, like the, the columnar grains, we see that it does not change much at 1100 degrees C. At 1150, we start seeing, after eight hours, some blue regions here, uh, considerably, which would correspond to low uh, GMB densities, which would be an indication of a certain amount of crystallization. And it is not until eight hours at 1200 degrees C that we see large fractions of these blue grains or these blue zones. Yeah. If we look now, yeah, if we look now at the, the 70 micron uh, samples, the 70 micron microstructure, we see that already at uh, 1150, after eight hours, we do have a significant fraction of these recrystallized uh, grains. Even at, at uh, 1100, we see some uh, small areas, and at 1200, we see very clear uh, that this material has achieved almost full recrystallization. Right? Uh, more indications of this, uh, this, this little change in the case of 50 micron, the pole figures, we see that the strong texture is kept through most of the uh, treatments. Here we have just single points of the very like the individual grains, let's say. And in the case of 70, we have no texture all like through all the, the thermal treatments. Now it is quite difficult, it can be quite difficult to quantify from the GMD maps the, the crystallized fraction, but we can take the twin boundary uh, peak frequency as an indicator, like as a sort of an indicator of the degree of crystallization. So if you look here, the blue areas, for example, in the top correspond, like, I don't know if you see from the back, but the twin boundaries are plotted in, in red here. But for example, if we focus on this grain here, I have twin boundaries. We focus on this, it's covered by the legend. But if you fo focus here, twin boundaries. Here down, this uh, blue region, plenty of twin boundaries. If I move down here, I don't have these twin boundaries, yeah? So by taking this uh, twin boundary frequency from the mesodentation angle distribution, we can plot this evolution of recrystallization in both microstructures. So we see very clear that at 1100 uh, degrees, we have basically no evolution, even after eight hours. At uh, 1150, we see that the 70 micro the microstructure, which is the uh, orange one, has evolved quite significantly, yeah, even after four hours. And uh, it is only at 1200 that we see a very clear uh, amount of recrystallization in both cases. Yeah, just to to paint the full picture of this final state. Yeah, we have in both cases large fractions of these grains. We have these twin boundaries all over the place, and what we see is that uh, the grain size is larger than in the initial microstructure. And in both cases, we have basically equiax grains. Now, yeah, so the microstructure has evolved significantly in both cases. If we move now to the last part, uh, some hardness measurements have been made on all samples. So in all cases, I plotted here the Asbin state, yeah? And we would expect after a solution treatment from an LPVF sample to have a lower hardness generally. But 
Remember, in our vacuum furnace, we have some limitations in the cooling rates. So I have gamma prime precipitating. Even after this solution between, if I cooled rapidly, I would not have the amount of gamma prime that I have in this case. Yeah? But I do have, in the case of 1100 degrees, some eta phase. Yeah? This is responsible for the large scatter in these samples. It is not a homogeneous precipitation. I have it in some places. This is a hardening uh, phase. That's why here I have a large scatter. And if we focus on these two uh, temperatures for the treatments, we see that for a 70 micro structure, as we uh, extend the dwell time, the hardness decreases. This is maybe due to a recovery, like we have less dislocation density in these cases. In the 50 micron, we see that it's, it, it's harder for it to evolve, but at 100, we do see a certain decrease. This goes all like it makes sense when looking at the microstructures that we obtain. So from this, we can conclude that at 1100 degrees C, we do not have any signs, any clear signs of recrystallization, but we do have precipitation in the phase, which we do not want. We see that samples with a smaller grain size and weaker starting textures have a slightly lower crystallization temperature, and that it is only at 1200 degrees C and after eight hours that we observe significant crystallization in all cases. Our hypothesis for these differences are that the smaller grain size in the 50, uh, 70 micro micro structure, which means a larger area, a fraction of grain boundaries, and a weaker texture, which means higher misorientation angles between these grains, is what leads to this faster recrystallization. And I will add that we need to study the precipitation, the precipitate formation with faster cooling rates from adequate industrial conditions. And we want to study also the, the, the other uh, thermal treatment uh, steps of uh, Inconel 99 to finally develop the full thermal treatment for its industrial applications. So with this, I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them.